It was something a little different today, and as Arthur has pointed out, often what I'm talking about is how Darwin and Darwin's theory helps us to understand or gives us a different insight into things, uh, not only into science, but in, into religion and into ethics and morality and community. Uh, and those are the kind of things uh, that I, I study. Uh, how Darwin helps us. So today, though, I'm going to, a little bit different, and point out that, uh, once again, Darwin, at least Darwinism, may need our help. Uh, let me give you a little background on uh, this, this talk. So uh, at Hofstra, we have a new major uh, in religion and contemporary issues with several tracks. And the most popular track is religion and contemporary issues in law, politics, and ethics. And so uh, last semester, I taught the, the foundational course for that for the first time. And at the end of the semester, I gave students an opportunity to write their final paper on a topic we hadn't covered. And uh, one of the students, uh, Abigail Anderson, who I believe is with us here today, a wonderful student in the class, said she wanted to do it on evolution in the courts. And that's one of the topics, strangely enough, I did not cover because I was trying to focus the class on issues that are more relevant to what's going on right now. And uh, th this is a positive thing. Uh, evolution has, has kind of faded from uh, the courts. As far as I know, there, there may be some cases that I'm missing. But the last major course, uh, court case on evolution, and it didn't even reach the Supreme Court, was in 2005. It's Fitzmiller versus Dover, which we'll talk about. Uh, but what Abigail pointed out is, uh, given of the recent uh, trend of the Supreme Court and their unprecedented uh, you know, uh, deference to religious claims, uh, that some of these cases might have application to the teaching of evolution. And so I said, that, that, that's great. Sounds like a great paper. She, she wrote a wonderful paper. And, and that, that paper inspired me today. So in, you know, another thing scientists do, of course, is give credit and cite sources. So I want to start off by uh, citing my source and uh, uh, thanking uh, Abigail for that paper. As I said to her, uh, that paper made me think. And is that not the best thing you can say about a piece of writing? It made me think. So uh, that's the talk today. Uh, secularism under siege, uh, is Darwin safe? So I have a PowerPoint. Uh, if Jared can get it up, I can share it with you. Uh, if not, I'll just try to make it as clear as possible. And the other thing, though, is keeping track of my time. <laughs> oh, there's a clock back there. And we're just about half an hour, 30. Oh, OK. All right. So, uh, so here we go. There we go. OK. It's a, a picture of Darwin from the uh, Museum of Natural History at Oxford. So what I want to do is just you know, kind of quickly go over uh, some of the key uh, points uh, of the history of Darwin in the courts in the United States, uh, and then update what's going on in the Supreme Court today and what that might mean for Darwin, but not just for Darwin, for secularism, and I would say for democracy in general. Uh, so that's where we'll go. Uh, so some of this may be familiar to you. So the, the, the PowerPoint, uh, you know, just uh, I, I can make this available. You don't have to worry about reading too much. But the first famous case, of course, is the 1925 uh, Scopes Monkey Trial, uh, where John Scopes uh, was arrested for uh, violating the anti-evolution laws uh, in class. And uh, this became a huge, the, with the first trial of the century, mass media covering it because uh, Clarence Darrow came in to defend uh, Scopes on behalf of the ACLU, and William Jennings Bryant, who was probably the most famous politician uh, in the United States at that time, ran three times unsuccessfully for president on a very liberal, very populist uh, uh, platform. But he also was a, uh, fundamentalist Christian and felt that this was an opportunity to uh, protect uh, Christianity in America from the encroachment of science and modernism. Uh, so uh, th th this case is uh, memorialized in Inherit the Wind, the wonderful movie, and I, I, I recommend that to you. Uh, but in this, this is seen as, uh, the movie certainly presents it as a great victory for science and reason in Darwin, because uh, Darrow is able to really undermine and show many of the arguments that Brian had to be, you know, 
really un unsubstantiated. Uh, but actually, of course, you know, it's, he lost the case because Scopes did, in fact, break the law. Uh, the ACLU expected that to happen. They wanted to use this to take it to the Supreme Court. That didn't happen because the judge there fined uh, uh, Scopes, I think it was $100, uh, and that was a violation of due process. If, if he was going to give a, a fine over $50, it had to go before a jury, and he did it on his own. So the case was thrown out, and it never got to the Supreme Court. But it really can be seen more as a victory for the anti-evolution forces, because what happened after that is a spate of anti-evolution laws across particularly the South and, and, and Midwest. Uh, so that became a very common you know, strategy to keep evolution out of the schools. Uh, so the next, another major case in 1968, Epperson versus Arkansas. Epperson, Susan Epperson was a science teacher uh, who was protesting against having, uh, not being allowed to teach evolution in her biology class. And the Supreme Court then unanimously struck down the law. The law went to 1928, so this law is one of the laws that came into effect after the monkey trial. Uh, and it was banning the teaching of evolution in Arkansas schools. Uh, they uh, struck down that law saying it was a violation of the Establishment Clause, because the reason to keep evolution out of the classroom is not grounded in science, it's grounded in religion, and a particular religion, Christianity, but even a particular kind of Christianity, a conservative Protestantism. Uh, so that went out. So the anti-evolution forces, of course, are, are very uh, persistent, so they change strategy. So the strategy developed after that was not banning evolution. Of course, we're going to teach evolution. It's science, right? But we want to teach the controversy, right? And we want to teach the alternatives. And the alternatives that they presented was something called creation science, uh, an oxymoron, if there ever were one. Uh, and this is using the book of Genesis as the scientific text to explain the origin of the world and of human beings. So creation science. Uh, and that, that was being taught in various schools, uh, again, throughout the South, uh, until 1987, with this case Edwards versus uh, Aguilar. So what the, the creation science strategy was is a, a balanced treatment. Of course, we'll teach evolution, but we want to teach the alternatives. And Edwards uh, argued against this, that this was not science. And being compelled to teach this in his science classroom was compelling his speech and also compelling him to support a religious view that he did not accept. Um, this was important because I think there were 72 Nobel Prize winning scientists who uh, testified in the case. Stephen Jay Gould testified in the case. 14 different national academies of science, uh, all making the case that indeed creation science is not science. Uh, and so at that point, the teaching of creation science was banned. Right? Uh, the balanced treatment uh, strategy failed. And not to be deterred, the, the next iteration of this anti-evolution strategy was the development of what was called uh, you know, intelligent design. Right? Uh, this had more of a scientific patina about it. Uh, and there was a scientist, Michael Behe, who became sort of the foreperson for this. The basic argument of intelligent design is that, and he was a biochemist, if you look at life on its cellular level, there are elements inside the cell, he argued, that could not have evolved gradually, right? That they were, he called it, irreducibly complex. You get to a level where, he's not denying that evolution works. It's just that evolution has to start with something, with a plan that was, he says, intelligently designed, right? We don't talk about who the designer is, God, right? But, it, and that was not mentioned in the textbook, Pandas and People, but here was being presented as a scientific theory. Uh, and uh, so this became now, you know, part of teaching the controversy over evolution, and, and there are alternatives to this. Uh, so this started to show up. The, the final blow that's premature to anti-evolution laws uh, is this case in 2005, Kitzmiller versus Dover Area School District. So this is a school district in Pennsylvania that was requiring teachers right, to teach the controversy, teach evolution, Darwinian evolution, but intelligent design also. Uh, so a number of parents protested against this and uh, against the school district. And uh, finally, this reached uh, the state courts. 
Uh, and Judge John E. Jones uh, III, and he, he visited Hofstra not long after this, we had the opportunity to speak with him, uh, got the case. This made the intelligent design people very happy because Judge Jones was appointed by a Republican, uh, was a conservative judge, and a Christian. So if this is the perfect judge. Jim, do you have another slide? Oh, are we, uh, where are we here? Oh, yes, thing. Okay, now we're caught up. So that slides one slide ahead of, uh, behind mine. Anyway, okay. So yes, so I'm going to have to go over here. Um, for some reason, okay, my slide's behind it. Let me move this here. Uh, anyway, so they were very, you know, very excited about having Judge Jones. Uh, it, it, they were disappointed. Uh, Judge Jones uh, did the, the equivalent of a judicial slap down uh, against the uh, people bringing this. What came out in the court uh, case is clearly that intelligent design did not meet the standards of science. Uh, there were no experiments to test the claims. Uh, when other scientists began to test the claims, they found the claims unsubstantiated. The things that the intelligent design people said couldn't evolve, they were able to show did evolve in, in cellular experiments. Uh, and uh, so it, it was not meeting any of the standards of science. Right? Uh, clearly, even though this wasn't in the textbook, the designer was God and it was a Christian version of God. So as he said, this is just creation science in different garb, right? Uh, and I, so I don't have this quote here. He, he pointed out that uh, he, the, the breathtaking inanity of the board's decision is evident when considered against the factual backdrop that came out through the case. One of the things that came out is many of the teachers who were teaching it had no idea what intelligence design was. They didn't feel they needed to because they said, we're not teaching science, we're teaching the controversy. Uh, so they didn't need to know the facts of the case. This, this is the, you know, the, uh, what's the term, the breathtaking inanity uh, of the case. And as he said, it was uh, a, a, a resulting in an utter waste of monetary and personal resources. So again, that coming from a conservative judge was really seen as perhaps the death knell of these legal challenges to evolution or attempts to sneak religion into the science uh, classrooms. And I said, there may be other court cases out there percolating that I'm not aware of, and if you are, I'd be happy to hear about them. Uh, but I want to say that we're, we, we're, you know, so you can go to the, the, the next slide. Thank you. I, I should have been telling you this, my bad. Uh, so is Darwin safe? Not quite. And there are three concerns I want to raise. One is uh, state legislatures, right? So this I just discovered in 2017, South Dakota, uh, passed laws that, uh, the law said that they could not prohibit teachers from questioning scientific theory, established scientific theories. Specifically, they're looking at evolution and now climate change. Right? I think one of the reasons that evolution sort of fell out of favor with the, you know, the conservative religious movement was not that they were okay with it. They saw that perhaps that was a dead end, and then they found a new foil, which is climate change. So that's, that's become uh, sort of, again, the, the target of many of these very conservative religious uh, educational movements. So uh, they wanted to uh, pass laws saying that school boards could not stop teachers from questioning this, uh, that that was eventually overturned, right? Uh, and in 2018, the Arizona Board of Education declared that uh, there were efforts being made to force teachers to teach the strengths and weaknesses of scientific theories, which sounds on the surface reasonable. Except, you know, when we talk about scientific theories, we're not talking about strength and weaknesses. We're talking about the evidence. We're talking about the probability, the rigor of the studies. We're talking about alternative, you know, critical studies. Uh, strength and weaknesses has become a, you know, cover term for, you know, teaching about the other views, uh, te teaching against views that you don't like. And so they wanted to introduce that into the uh, curriculum, but that was overturned by the Arizona Board of Education. So this is just that there are still ha things happening in school boards and state legislatures where evolution, and often you know, coupled with climate change, uh, certainly is um, in danger. Okay, so the next slide. Uh, public opinion. Right? So this is one of the more recent public opinion, a poll about uh, American views on uh, evolution. 
uh, and in terms of religion. Uh, enough. So this was in 2013, it's by Pew, and they found that in 2013, of all adults, right, 60% uh, agree that humans have evolved over time. Uh, now of that 60%, many of them believe they have evolved over time guided by God, but at least evolution gets into their worldviews. And only 33 are, uh, believe that humans have existed in the present form since the beginning of time. Right? Not bad, considered, considering. Right? But we break this down by religion. And we can see uh, the, 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 the strongest anti-evolution camp are white evangelical Protestants. 64% believing that humans existed in the present form since beginning. Black Protestants, about 50-50. Hispanic ca uh, Catholics, only 31 reject evolution. White Catholics is down to 26. Uh, and then we get white mainline Protestants, 15%. Uh, and this is in there, the, uh, I, know, I don't know the numbers. Uh, I think the numbers on Islam uh, is similar to the black Protestants and Hispanic uh, Catholics as I've seen. And the numbers on Jews is they're, they're one of the most open to evolutionary uh, science and rejecting the, the uh, humans existed in their present form from the beginning. So there's uh, a lot of doubt out there among certain groups, white evangelical Protestants who have become very uh, active uh, judicially. Uh, we can, one more chart, we go to the next one, uh, Jared. Uh, growing partisans differences in beliefs about evolution. So in uh, 2009, 54% of uh, Republicans uh, had uh, accepted evolution in some form, only 39% rejecting it. Uh, that has shifted significantly from 2009 to uh, 2013, where it's up to almost half uh, believe that humans existed in the present form from the beginning. I couldn't find, uh, but I'm sure if I did a digger deep, what, what those numbers are now. But we're comparing this to uh, Democrats, we see that Democrats have actually increased in their openness to evolution. So uh, this concerns me, and I think it should concern us, because of the growing partisan divide in this country in general. Right? Uh, as you know, w one of the things we're seeing uh, is that these religious beliefs are uh, coming to stand in for political identification. Uh, for example, one of the things that was stunning, uh, over the last year or two, there's been an increase in white evangelicals. And that's pushing back against a trend that had been going down for, for decades. The number of white evangelicals has been decreasing. It went up in 2022. And what's interesting about that is a good number of these people who were even, not evangelical in 2016, but evangelical in 2020, uh, is that uh, many of them are, there are Muslims, there are atheists, right? there are Catholics, Right, uh, so there are Jews, right? People who, so they're not embracing the evangelical identity because of their religious beliefs. It's because of the association between evangelicalism and Trumpism, right? Uh, so where religion is now a stand-in for politics. So with the increasing divisiveness uh, of politics, uh, that you know, and that science evolution, climate change is getting swept up in those divides, which I think you know, makes for dangerous times for, for Darwin. Okay, go to the, the next slide, thank you. And that is the US Supreme Court. So uh, uh, this is not controversial to say that this is the most pro-religion court in the history of the United States. Right? And it is an activist court. So the, the makeup of the court is interesting. It is, pre, it is dominated by Catholics seven Catholics, uh, Elena Kagan is now the one Jewish uh, justice, and Kadanji Brown Jackson is a non-denominational uh, Protestant. Uh, and this is interesting, uh, she's the first Protestant on the court in quite a while. There's been a major decline in the influence of Protestants in the higher echelons of government, and an increase in the number of Catholics who are represented. Uh, what's interesting and relevant about the Catholic group is that except for Sonia Sotomayor, uh, the other justices are not only Catholic, but they, they all adhere to various um, or come from various conservative forms of Catholicism. 
I have a, this is the asterisk next to Gorsuk. Is Gorsuk uh, grew up Catholic, but has recently started attending a, uh, a Protestant church. All right, so we have the, the religious makeup of the court. Okay, the next slide we'll go to. Uh, what I want to do is talk about, uh, my con kind of crystallize my concerns in two particular recent court cases. Uh, and the first one is, uh, it was just decided last year, Kennedy versus Bremerton School District. And you may be familiar with this. This is the praying football coach, right? So Kennedy was the football coach of a public school in the Bremerton School District. And uh, he began uh, as a, an act of private devotion. After the game, win or lose, he'd kneel down on the 50-yard line, say a quiet prayer, right? Uh, then some of his, his uh, uh, Students, <laughs> his student athletes, thank you, Arthur. His student athletes would join him, and then the whole team would join him, and then the other team would join them, and then it was people from the stands were coming into this. So uh, there were some parents at the school uh, whose children were not religious or certainly uh, were uncomfortable with the encroachment of religion into the public school who protested, and the school said, you can't do this. This is a public school. You can, you can go in your, your, your office and pray. You can go quiet. But you can't do this. And uh, he continued to do it. And so his contract was not renewed. And so he sued. And this went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled six to three in his favor, uh, with uh, Ju Gors Justice Gorsuch writing the um, opinion. Uh, so they argued that the school district prohibiting him from praying after the games violated his free exercise right, right? According to Gorsuch, Kennedy offered his prayers quietly while the students were otherwise occupied and made short private personal prayer, right? uh, The school district's action rested on a mistaken view that it had a duty to ferret out and suppress religious observances even as it allows comparable secular speech. The, con the Constitution neither mandates nor tolerates that kind of discrimination. Clearly the key point here is uh, this middle point that Kennedy offered prayers quietly while the students were otherwise occupied, short private personal prayers. The dissent just sent in a picture, right? That was their dissent, which is this picture with him being surrounded by 50, 60 people. What is stunning is the distortion of the facts of the case as they were presented to fit the narrative that Gorsuch wanted which is that the schools were hounding Christians and trying to prevent them their, their free liberty, uh, free exercise uh, rights. So that, that is stunning, right? So it's not whatever we can think of the legal uh, evaluation, it's the willingness in public, in, in a legal document, to distort the facts so grossly. That's really concerning. All right, the second case, and this concerns me, and I think perhaps us more if we can go on to the next one, uh, this is Tandon versus Newsom. This is decided in 2021. So uh, Newsom is the, the governor of California. And so during the early days of the pandemic, he, as many other governors, put restrictions right, to try and keep public safe based on the best available science. Uh, one, the, the one restriction here that people were balking against was uh, he restricted indoor gatherings in homes to three families, right? Trying to limit, right? Got a little COVID bubble, if we all remember that. Uh, and to, to try and you know, combat the spread of this. This was challenged by a group of people who were having Bible study uh, in their homes. And they argued that our Bible studies often require more than three families coming together. It's a community coming together. And so that this law was uh, inhibiting, was burdening their free exercise of religion. Uh, and it was a violation then of the First Amendment. The Supreme Court ruled five to four against the state. Right? So they ruled in favor of the Bible study groups. And again, it's the reasoning that's of great concern. So go to the next slide. Um, so they argue that government regulations are not neutral and generally applicable, and therefore trigger strict scrutiny under the free exercise clause, clause whenever they treat any comparable secular activity more favorably than religious uh, exercise. So. Uh, in one sense, this is like what you, you, if you're going to tell a secular activity that you know, secular people it's okay to do something, you can't tell religious people it's not okay to do something, right? If they're doing the same thing, that makes sense. But it's their expansion of what counts as comparable, comparable secular activity. 
So part of this was also the restriction on uh, uh, in-person services in churches, et cetera, uh, and limiting that because of the number of people. So one of the arguments made is, well, so uh, you're, you're, if, if you're going to prohibit that, then can people go to a movie theater? Can they go to a concert? Can they uh, go to uh, the theater? And the state said, no, <laughs> they can't do any of those things. All of those things were prohibited, right? So no church gatherings, no going to movie theaters, right? Where large numbers of people are gathering and sitting for hours indoors, that's dangerous. They were all prohibited. So that seems comparable, right? So if they said no church, but yeah, but go to the Cinemax, right? So the Cinemark, uh, that would seem wrong, right? But that's not what they did. But here's the argument. It's like they, they argued that you're telling us that religious people can't go to the church, but they can go to the grocery store, right? There are no limits on how many families can go to the grocery store. There's no limits on how many people can go to the liquor store. Oh, is the courts in, in California raising the right to buy liquor over the right to practice a religion? Uh, yes, they are. And therefore, the law is a, uh, a burden on people's religious practices. So this is what's stunning. Right? Now, of course, there's a world of difference between going to a grocery store, in and out, or how many times you're going to spend there, and sitting in a gathering for hours where people are singing and preaching there's a world of difference. And in this case, all the scientific experts, the epidemiologists and, and medical people came in and said, yes, it's much more dangerous to sit in an enclosed space for hours, whether it's a church, a theater, than it is to go grocery shopping. And the court dismissed that argument. And, and they, they made the point, they said, a person's religious liberty is not subject to the opinion of unelected experts. So what they are dismissing scientific evidence, scientific expertise as testimony that's going to count. Right? So this is what makes <laughs> me really concerned. Uh, this is what makes me think Abigail was prescient <laughs> in, in her concern about where things may be going. Uh, so you can just, the next slide. Uh, yeah, so uh, you can read this later. So uh, there's a, a pushback against this, so the concern is what the court is saying here is any time there's an, any exemption for any secular activity, you must give an exemption to religious activity. Right? It doesn't, so their comparability is gone, right? So you let people go to buy uh, liquor, well, then they get to go to church, right? Uh, so the, the, there's the Columbia Law School project on religion, rights, and law, rights and religion says, this is, they call this discrimination on steroids. What this seems to suggest is anytime anybody asks for a religious exemption, right, they have to be granted it if there's any secular exemption whatsoever. Uh, so, for example, it was argued that, uh, so this is not in the court case, this is the, 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 the law project, uh, police and ambulance and fire trucks are not required to follow the posted speed limits. There's an exemption for them. Does that mean then we have to give exemptions to religious vehicles? Right? If you're making a secular exemption, you have to give a religious exemption. So again, this is just expanded notion of, of what counts as discrimination against religion. Uh, and also they point out that this, this new court uh, is privileging, right? is creating a tiering of constitutional rights and it's offering religious practice a level of protection that's greater than other fundamental constitutional rights, including rights to privacy and equality. Right? Uh, as we could see in the Dobbs, Jackson, you know, the right to privacy, despite 50 years of precedent, uh, went, went away. Right? Uh, while new rights uh, of religious expression and religious practice seem to be uh, being created by the court. So uh, next slide, uh, so we'll go past this. Um, what does this pretend for Darwin and what does it pretend for democracy? Nothing good, right? This is very concerning for anyone who uh, cares about the separation of church and state. So this is not just a secular issue. Uh, it is an issue, again, for people who believe that in a democracy, there must be freedom of religion for everyone and no one gets to impose their religion on uh, other people. Uh, what do we do about it? I, was, I always try to end on a, on a, on a positive note. <laughs> having a little, little bit of a difficult time uh, in, in, at this moment in, in our history. Um, and my students ask me this, and that is, 
make yourself aware. Be, be, pay attention to what's happening before it happens. Right? Know what's going before the court. And, and what you can do in terms of your, your local legislators and local school boards and what's happening, uh, you know, what, what's going on in terms of these issues. So I, I'll leave you with just one thing to, to, to watch out for. Uh, one more slide. Actually, I only want to talk about this one because this is going to happen soon. Uh, and, and this is what makes me, again, very worried for Darwin. So created versus Alenis. This was the arguments we just heard in December. It's going to be decided sometime this year. So this is the next iteration. I'm sure you're all familiar with the, you may be the masterpiece cake shop uh, case. This is where the, this cake, uh, this baker wanted to refuse to make a wedding cake for a same sex couple. Uh, they sued. Uh, that case got decided in his favor, but on procedural grounds. They didn't really address the constitutional issue. This, so now this, there's this group, uh, and I'm sorry I forget the name of the group, the group that's bringing this. Uh, creative versus Alenis. So uh, uh, Creative is the name of this website. Uh, Lori Smith is, has his website. She designs websites. And she's going to design websites for weddings. But as a conservative Christian, she does not want to offer these services to same-sex couples. <clears throat> and she wants to be able to put that on her website. The state told her, you can't do that because that's discrimination and you can't advertise that you're going to discriminate. This hasn't happened yet. This is the interesting thing. She hasn't designed a single website for weddings. Uh, nobody's, nobody's been harmed in this, right? She wants to do this, and she doesn't want to be burdened. So uh, there's the group that has been pushing this, and again, I forget their names, but what I do know about them is that they are identified by the Southern Poverty Law Center as an anti-LBGTQ hate group, right, that's pushing this. So we can see what's behind this. So. This is going to be heard by the Supreme Court. Arguments were heard. Uh, what we know about the arguments are concerning. Uh, but what's, what's at stake here right, is you know, the argument is based on that by preventing her right, from making this, this, having this exemption, by forcing her to make a website for weddings for uh, same-sex couples, she is being forced to speak her approval of this. It's a violation of her free speech and a violation of her religious liberties since she's religiously opposed to same-sex marriages. So it's being held on freedom of speech and freedom of religion grounds. Right? Uh, if the court sides with uh, creative, and I would bet any amount of money that they are going to side with creative. Right? This is giving people, and this has been the concern, that a, now a legal right to discriminate based on religion, right? To discriminate against, you know, here these cases have been against the LGBTQ community, uh, but we know there have been cases, you know, what about a, 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 a company or people who feel that God did not intend for the races to mix and so is opposed to, you know, uh, mixed race uh, weddings or couples? We can just see there, there's almost no limit, right, to what can be opposed on religious grounds. Uh, and the court is going this way. Uh, you know, how long is it, will it be before we hear some teachers saying that having to teach evolution violates their religious belief? Or, uh, this is what I think would actually happen, a teacher decides to express privately in front of the class that they believe that evolution is wrong because God created the world 6,000 years ago in six days and gets reprimanded by her school board for doing this, right? And protests that she is just expressing a private opinion in front of the classroom, right? The, the Kennedy case comes in here and brings that to the Supreme Court. We're in a time, we know, where state legislatures and governors are banning the teaching of critical race theory, uh, banning any teaching related to the LGBTQ community, uh, there have been attempts to restrict teaching of climate science. So is it long before Darwin is uh, you know, caught up into this? Uh, so again, I think there's reason to be concerned, uh, and there's reason to be very aware and very active about what's going on with your local legislatures and, and school boards. And uh, that's as positive a note as I can end on. Thank you very much.